Well, hello to hello. our first ever episode as these hosts. My name is Nicola Merko. This is Nick Klaus. That is Iveta. And uh, we are joined here with Adam Cernotta, our RGSL rector and professor. And uh, we at RGSL are uh, very grateful to have an international environment. And uh, we are quite lucky to have a rector with such globally diverse uh, background and experience with uh, Polish law, Latvian now even, Australian. So let's get into our first episode with you. So why exactly RGSL? What brought you here? You see, uh, well, I am from this part of the world, right? It means from the Central Eastern Europe. And I spent, what, 35 years in Australia. And uh, then I thought when somebody told me about this position here and uh, suggested apply for the position, then I thought, mm, maybe I'm too old for the, such type of job. But, uh, <coughs> but nevertheless, I. I apply, right, and, and treat it as a sort of the adventure from my point of view, and uh, so far it works, right? It means <laughs> new, new uh, <coughs> experiences, right? And uh, what I, I and, and also I learn a lot actually because it's a, so to speak, is a not commercial, but but it is institution which uh, operate partly on the commercial way, and. Uh, I never worked in such type of institution because so, that my university in Australia was a state university mm -hmm. and in Poland too, state universities. I've got this, uh, you know, three years in, in Spain when I ran the International Institute for the Sociology of Law, but it was also <coughs> not a not commercial institution. It was sponsored by the Basque country government, right? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, something which is new for me. Right? Mm -hmm. So as RGSL is uh, your new home, what future do you see for it? Future? For the upcoming future, maybe some upcoming plans? Uh, should I speak um, about my vision? Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. Have, right? more precisely, yeah. Well, I would like to see this, you know, this institution, RGSL, as a sort of the magnet institution for the, for the Baltic states, right? It means the institution in which there will be exchange of ideas and uh, and uh, a lot of people will come in right and, and deliver the lectures this year we've got 25th anniversary so uh, we will have a series of 25th anniversary lectures and it seems to me that that's the role actually because of the English language as a <coughs> as a language of instruction and then the mm, contact with uh, with other universities uh, through the visiting lectures, right? that that's something when the, this institution will bring a ferment actually in the, to, to to other institutions, or let's say other universities in Latvia, but also in the Baltic states. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> for example, when talking about mistakes, because everybody makes them from time to time, um, do you think that mistakes should be feared? Or should we focus more on growth and the lessons we can learn from them? Mistakes, mm -hmm. but you mean mistakes on the institutional level or the individual <coughs> level? For example, for students, you said that we are not really active in participating, maybe because I, I don't want to talk about yeah. for everybody, but for example, me. Sometimes I feel f like I feel fear. I don't want to say something out loud in case I'm, I'm not right. So should we maybe focus more on growth and lessons learned, as I said? Well, we talk about basically on the educational process. Mm -hmm. Always is based on mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. And um, what I tried, so what I told my students here when I ran my course, that there are no stupid questions. There are only yeah. possible stupid means. There are no stupid answers. There's only mm. possible stupid questions. That means the lecturers are in the much worse position mm. than the students, actually, right? It means that <coughs> yeah, we are all learn from the from the mistakes. There is a sort of the saying that only you know, the, <coughs> the wise people they learn on the from mistakes, mm -hmm. but not their own mistakes, yeah. on the mistakes of others, right? So that uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, students shouldn't be afraid because it's a sort of the growing, right? process, it means a learning process mm -hmm. as such. So therefore, the, 
it's inevitable that the young people, not only young people, through the, our life we, we make a lot of mistakes, right? It's only problem what we will do with these mistakes, mm. right? If there is a reflection upon mistakes and uh, development of some strategies, actually, what to do to avoid mistakes in the future, that's the probably way to go. Yeah, and talking about future, um, would you say that learning road never ends? Uh, that people are learning along the way through different perspectives, our mistakes, other mistakes? That, mm, yes, Miss, if I understand your question, is a question about the, about the learning process, mm -hmm. right? But the learning process, nowadays, if you look, nowadays I mean the 21st century, there is a never-ending process. It yeah. means, look, I'm a very old guy now, but I'm still learning, right? Mm -hmm. Even here in this job, I, uh, I learn a lot. So, is a sort of young people, let's say the students now, in, let's say in the, beginning, in the tw early 20s, they should prepare themselves that they will learn to the end of their life. There are statistical, actually, data which shows that that um, in, on this turn between 20 and 21st century, usually there's a prediction that, that uh, each person will change three times their jobs, which what I mean is mm -hmm. changing jobs. It means acquiring the new knowledge, right, and uh, moving on, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> which presuppose learning process, permanent learning process, yeah? Yeah, especially I think when if techno uh, technology is evolving mm -hmm. and uh, I think even the professions like lawyers, which kind of seemed like out, uh, out of the touch of technology, which means that uh, uh, they're kind of invulnerable. Oh, lawyers are always going to have a job, it's always going to be fine, but uh, what we can see with AI technology and things like that, that uh, the lawyer profession also is going to change. Maybe, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on the that? character of the, pro yeah, of the, yeah, of the yeah. profession? Yeah, yeah, it is. That's uh, something which, uh, you know, technology, I am from this generation which actually was forced to adapt very quickly, right, to the development of the, of the IT technology. And I can't say that I am good in this. No, no, it was uh, actually my former university was a permanent uh, problem with uh, photocopier. It means each year they change a new one, and I have to learn from the very beginning like, what to do, how to, what button to push in order to uh, to achieve something what I want, right? <coughs> but uh, no, you are right. That the 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 character of the profession is is in the process of the rapid change, mm -hmm. right? It means uh, legal professions under the influence of the new technologies. So now the question is how to incorporate actually these new technologies to the process of, of teaching, of learning, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, there's a challenge with, uh, is, uh, with artificial intelligence and a challenge for the legal profession, but also challenge for the legal education as well. Yeah, we just, I think, at least I saw on the news that in America, uh, an AI has pa passed the bar exam. Oh, or oh yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. Or not the bar exam, or the the, the exam to get into uh, law school. Law school. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. And uh, with a C plus grade yeah, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So I think this is also another aspect, like the what you mentioned, that the mm -hmm. uh, education process also has to adapt to this. Uh, uh, process. Yeah, it will be before us, it will be for each university actually now is a challenge, right, with new application which could write essays easily, right, and mm -hmm. very good essays actually. So what to do, what to, you know, plagiarism, as you know, in RGSL is a zero tolerance for plagiarism, mm -hmm. but how to treat that essay written mm -hmm. by the, by the, some, some technological application, right. Mm -hmm. And um, what to do, to go to the handwriting only, <laughs> but, um, or to still, you know, keep this this uh, <coughs> technological devices, mm -hmm. right? So it's a you know it's a rapid change. That's why it seems to me that uh, not information is important, but important is what to do with this information because nowadays it's easily to find the information, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But how to transform this information so that the digest and apply later on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So it's, that's required change probably in the educational process. And that, this, this change is, uh, now it's occurring, you know, it seems to me now, now that, that not uh, only passing on information, mm -hmm. but rather the, to equip students with uh, analytical tools, how to, what to do with this information. So where to find it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what does it mean, right, this information? and how to apply it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's uh, kind of the biggest challenges. And I think in our study process that information is quite easily accessible, findable, but how to apply it to, to exams or cases that we look at. And uh, yeah, I think that's the biggest problem, mm -hmm. not the kind of sitting in the library and reading the books, but um, yeah. But even if we're like looking through our computers and trying to find information for a research paper or any type of topic that we have uh, during our class discussion, it raises the question of if it's true or false, and we can never know, only by finding legible resources and finding uh, the information through those, but those are sometimes not easily accessible. So it, it, that also raises like a challenge for us students, and not only students, of course, everyone in, in this field. I just read quite you know, a few days ago the information that, that uh, the children in Finland they are thought actually to what you know, how to make a distinction between the you know fake news or fake information and the proper one. So that's probably some there are some educational uh, techniques to which should be adapted everywhere actually okay. because you mentioned about the social media right it mm -hmm. means that that's something which is a, a fake information fake news and propaganda let's say which is mm -hmm. which is transformed through the social media yeah? yeah because for example me as i am a year one student this was like the biggest challenge for me personally because i went to obviously a high school where wikipedia was my best friend you could say mm -hmm. and even if our teachers said don't use it we were like oh wikipedia this is the like easy way out but now I actually have to search and involve time and involve my personal time into actually researching the topic that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a learning curve. It's a positive learning curve, but yeah, it raises some challenges as a year one student. I think for any year, if you're a student, that finding legible information is a difficult task at some point. Yeah, there's uh, probably one. <coughs> One of the issue <coughs> is actually too much information yes. right? because of the easiness to get information. So that's a, that's a, that we are, you know, getting too many right informations, and uh, one of the one of the elements of the educational process is basically the selection process, uh, <coughs> selection criteria. What is you know how to distinguish what is important, what is not important, the prim primary data and the secondary data. It means a cut off this, what is not important from the point of view of, you know, let's say, research interest, right? But that's connected with the uh, writing as well. It means the essays writing by, by students. It means not to, to put on compu you know, into computer everything, but precisely adopt some analytical skills, right? And uh, only, and make a, focus right it means to 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 write in relation to the essay's question mm -hmm. yeah i think the first time i kind of understood it was when we last year wrote our year one research paper and when we did our right outline i thought oh i have gathered so many great resources so many great articles by scholars that uh, my my professors have recommended that everything is fine but then I, then I kind of looked back and none of the articles I used, uh, oh. in identified in my outline, I actually used. I mm -hmm. used like maybe the laws, of course, but from the actual articles, I thought that uh, they don't go together. They kind of are good individual sources, but in the end, the paper, it didn't kind of make the story or the, uh, the it, right. yeah, it didn't connect the way I at least thought that it should. But it's always with the research, right? Yeah. This is the sort of the situation of iceberg, right? You only present this top when mm -hmm. be behind. What is behind the you know, <coughs> surface is a 
much more what you did in the process of, uh, of researching, right? mm -hmm. but not necessarily put it into, into your writing, in your essay. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe talking about your uh, scholarly exploits, <laughs> uh, we have previously, uh, our previous hosts have uh, had on this uh, podcast Martin Krieger, uh, which you also have some uh, connection with. Maybe you could uh, describe your relationship and how you have also worked with him uh, numerous times. And uh, yeah, how was it? Uh, Martin. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Martin is larger than life. <laughs> well, our, you know, the, when I arrived to Australia and, uh, and I knock on his door, and I didn't know that he speaks a bit of Polish at the time, because his family came from, from Poland. Uh, Actually, it was a quite interesting story because his his family, you know, escaped in the September 39 from Warsaw to Vilnius, and then was a one train the Stalin you know, allow for a one train to go from from Vilnius uh, with refugees from Poland to to Tokyo. It means across the entire continent, right? And they arrived to the to Vladivostok, and then the, there was a, you know, this Japanese or British uh, still ships who took them to, to Japan. And then they arrived to, to Australia. So anyway, come back to, to Martin. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I knock on this door, I you know, so prepare something, you know, my broken English. And, uh, and he said, oh, dzień dobry panu. It means he <laughs> said in Polish, you know, <coughs> good day, right? And that's how our relationship started. But from the is uh, we are f mm, close friends actually, and of course uh, also the collaborators on some issues. But the most important uh, event which shaped our research interests actually was a collapse of communism, right? Collapse of communism, which actually put us to the to the study of this uh, post-communist situation from the legal point of view and the rule of law, which Martin is an expert, right, on the writing on, on rule of law. So that nowadays we work on the, this uh, constitutional populist, what it's called. So there's a project with uh, three of us, <coughs> it means uh, Martin Krieger, Wojciech Sadurski and myself, right, and uh, the outcome of, of this project was a book which was published last year by the Cambridge University Press on this constitutional populism so that's, uh, you know, the relationship with Martin. And we also, you know, not sure, but in the parallel way, we taught the similar courses, right? and uh, say especially law and social theory, which uh, course, which Martin taught one, some class, I taught another classes, right? Yeah, so that's the, in nutshell, uh, compressed information about, mm -hmm. about my relationship with, with Martin, yeah. So with Martin Krieger, you both could say kind of work in the same field. So you found like a common ground, or similar, was it not that easy? Similar field, actually. It means that uh, uh, you know this uh, issue of uh, how to build a stable um, democracy in the region, let's say, and the interest in the constitutionalism, right? But uh, Martin were in this direction of rule of law and go outside, let's say, only this post-communist, let's say, type of situation. Uh, I could say that nowadays we differ in our opinion a bit, right? It means we uh, they are not the same, but uh, let's say my assessment of the some uh, legal reform is different than assessment made by by Martin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, yeah, but we share that sort of the research uh, areas, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, and the research interest and the exchange, though, is a fluctuation of we exchange texts. It means when, and of course, Martin played an important role in correction of my en written English. Right? So <laughs> when I wrote something in English, then I sent to Martin, Martin, please correct my English, <laughs> make it beautiful, Shakespearean one, <laughs> because he has a, has a talent in writing. Really, he's a very very good, uh, you know, uh, stylist. You could say, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is a saying in, uh, in Latvian, maybe even in English and Polish, that there's a saying that as many people, as many opinions. And uh, when it comes to research, I think every researcher has their own opinion, whether it would differ from uh, 
else's. So would you say it would be harder or cha more challenging to work with people with different opinions or would you find it more interesting? Uh, challenging? No, it seems to me that that's normal situation is a, is a pluralist situation, right? When the people don't mm -hmm. share the same opinion, but they exchange arguments. Mm -hmm. That's what, the, let's say, um, scholarship is about, right? It means if we agree, so what to do? We agree and that's it. Mm -hmm. But if we disagree or the, let's say our opinion is different, but at the same time, if we could exchange arguments and the uh, interlocutor is listening to the arguments, is taking them seriously, then is a sort of the, you know, progress in, in scholarship, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so the question is, let's say that they are, of course, you know, is, uh, is uh, if the people have that political opinion, then emotions are involved, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If they, you know, emotions are involved, it's extremely difficult actually to convince another, another side. But in uh, scholarship, right, in, in uh, scholarship that's a, uh, I don't want to say that emotion should be totally eliminated because it's not my, my idea, but it seems to me that they are under control, right? It's mm -hmm. under control of the, of the rational presentation of argumentation. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I would agree. Sometimes emotions get the best of us, even, as you've said, even for scholars mm -hmm. that we didn't know about. As maybe you have worked in Australia, also in Spain, and now in Eastern Europe, uh, even With also us. before <laughs> uh, in Eastern Europe, what do you think are the, like, the fundamental principles of law that kind of are looked differently in all these countries? Uh, of course, there are different systems of law in Australia and in uh, Europe, but uh, what are the kind of main main differences that maybe you have seen? Uh, okay, on the one level, like let's say in Australia, the common law system mm -hmm. is is different than the civil law system, continental, let's say civil law system, mm -hmm. they call. It. But on the other hand, there are some similarities. Right? It means there is a similar way of of uh, idea of law and the function mm -hmm. of law in society. What it seems to me, from my point of view, despite so many years in Australia, I could say that I knew about the common law, but I don't feel it. Which means that uh, attitude right, of the common law lawyers is not my attitude. Let me give you an example, let's say, that when I arrived to Australia, and I expect, I ask about the, what is regulation, and they told me, what regulation? What regulation? Regulation. Do it. What you want to do. If there will be problem, we we'll regulate. Right? <laughs> then it seems to me something that which is not not in civil law approach. Right? The civil law approach is sort of the a top down. We regulate and allow people to do something. Where there in the common law system is opposite actually. And uh, one of the you know, intellectual he compare actually this civil law system and common law system to the different two different types of the of gardens. As you know, there are English gardens mm -hmm. and the French style of gardens, right? Mm -hmm. The French style of gardens is when we simply force the nature right, to to do what we want to do. Uh, to do uh, how they should should look like actually. When in the English type of gardens is the opposite. It means that nature is growing up and they only cut from time to time. <laughs> it means it's a, and they are two different attitudes, right? It means in relation to, to common law and civil law. Uh, actually, I'm now working on the, to develop a new course, to offer a new course for the next year on the comparative law. And the, one of the elements will be this, you know, the similarities and differences between the civil law and the common law, uh, law system. And uh, but if you if you look, let's say, to the history, let's say Max Weber claimed that actually common law system and civil law system. The differences and the legal differences in legal reasoning were connected with legal education, the outcome of legal education, because the legal education in Europe started from the university when in England, right, that were no universities. They, it means the, 
the future lawyers, they le learn in practice, usually drinking beer, right? So, so <laughs> somewhere. <coughs> and in the pub. And it's in practice before the court, arguing, right? And uh, when here, that was not only the legal education at the university, but actually what was the the object of education was not existing legal system. So imagine now that you enroll at the university and they will teach you Roman law on the basis of Justinian code. And at the time they looked through the window, there was no Roman law. Not only Roman law, but there were no, no some institutions, like let's say no monetary exchange at the time, right? And, uh, but they, they read this Justinian code and make a meaning of that. So it means, meaning in the sort of the holistic way, right? When in, in, in common law, the beginning of common law, which started from the, you know, from the <coughs> law of land, actually, and uh, medieval feudal type of land, was uh, that legal education was totally different, much more practical, right? Mm -hmm. Which does not mean, from my point of view, that nowadays, in 21st century, the legal education must be reduced only to the practical thing. No. In, in opposite, it seems to me, that one of the most valuable things is a good theory, right? So that this theoretical part m must play an important role in the process of, of legal education. Definitely. I think without theory, you can't even be practical with it. You have to know something before you do something. Yeah, but usually, you know, in the in the sort of the average common sense discourse, there is a, that that opposition. It means practice versus theory. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who cares about theory, right? Yeah. But it seems to me that we should, because when we remember when we talk about information, for instance, where from are the criteria for the selection of information? Yeah from some theoretical assumptions which we accept. Right? So the issue is for the, let's say, for the legal education is to, to allow, not to impose theory on students, but to, to stimulate students that they became uh, conscious about the, their theoretical assumptions. Right? Yeah, even if you take it into practice, I think without the basis of having a theory, you can really have an legible outcome, if you could say so, because of course practice makes perfect and you have to be put in the position to know how to act. But without a theoretical research, how can you have some kind of basis for your uh, thesis or whatever you mm -hmm. are working on? That's my opinion, personally. Um, I remember the first assignment that we had in RGSL, the, like a big assignment, and legal philosophy. <laughs> we, we had uh, the R. R. V. Brown case yeah. mm -hmm. and it actually was a, 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 U, a case that happened in, in the UK so it was the first experience I had with actual law and actual kind of reading uh, judgments and things like that was uh, from the common law uh, system. Mm -hmm. So and I thought it was quite, quite, quite weird that all we did was look at precedents or, or uh, look at previous case law and not really what I kind of thought that we would go through laws like uh, like what we later did in contract law or civil law where we looked at the more Latvian system and uh, yeah that that was the kind of the difference that I saw that the uh, laws as as themselves they kind of didn't have as much uh, in them as maybe precedents mm -hmm. or the civil law. Uh, Contract. Yeah, yeah. But the R.B. Brown case was definitely an interesting one. We even had it for our first year in legal philosophy, I would say, even with reading a little bit of a little amount of it. Of course, we can't read all of the case study, but um, it was definitely interesting for me. That was like the first insight as to how we could be, how it would be mm -hmm. in the upcoming years. So that was a quite interesting outlook on it. Yeah. Mm. Maybe uh, going back to uh, uh, constitutionalism and populism, mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, what do you think kind of is the first uh, difficulties that these uh, post-communist countries uh, had and why, why some of them kind of turned out into democracies while maybe Poland and Hungary and others kind of had this democratic backsliding, what are the 
the requirements or the criteria on why maybe sometimes everything goes good, supposedly good, and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. Um, I don't want to talk about Hungary because you know I didn't study yeah. Hungarian case in, in depth, really. But I am familiar with the, let's say, Polish case. And um, a friend of mine, he, Wojciech Sadorski, he wrote a book about the, about the democratic backsliding, right, and the case of Poland. And I sort of disagree with him. It seems to me that, that uh, my observation, my assessment of the situation in Poland is okay. There is a sort of the bending of law, bending of the constitution, sometimes breaking the constitutional norms. But if we look from the mm, long duress, so called, let's say, longer perspective, time perspective, that it seems to me that uh, that we are we are facing the situation of a, of a constitutional. Hmm. Not maybe not only constitutional, but uh, that sort of the you know the the pains of a, of a new democracies, right? That uh, that is a sort of the constitutional correction taking place, not correction like by the government. But the question for me is why the same party was somehow <coughs> voted in, let's say, <coughs> won the elections twice, right? It means that was a wide majority of, of citizens support the program of this party. But why they support this program of this party? Uh, because pr probably what is expressed in this program was uh, assessed as a more democratic than the, what was presented by the opposition. So. The government is, it seems to me, is a, on the rhetorical level, is a populist. But show me the government which is on the rhetorical level, not populist. Is all of them use some populist rhetoric. But if you look now at the policies as such, they are not at all populist. It means they are sort of the extremely pragmatic, right? And uh, so the point number one. But number two is such that. Uh, that the first time since the 18, 1989 there was a development of the social policies. It means sort of the break with the neoliberal approach to the economical reforms and the development of the social policies for all those segments of society which were excluded from the benefits of transformation. You know, that, uh, that's not, not only, let's say, the technological exclusion, but uh, from the point of view of the transport as well, right? And it's an elimination of buses and trains. And, and why? Because of, the, of this economical rationalism. So now is a, they are political, let's say, and social issues. But from the legal point of view, it seems to me that pendulum is sort of this, you know, switching from one to another. And, uh, there are some necessary corrections taking place nowadays. What I mean by that is uh, undermining of the position of the constitutional courts means by the present government. It means, personally, I am for the, for <laughs> I've got this <coughs> opinion that, that each court should apply directly you know, the, the constitution, not only constitutional court. So what is rational that Twelve or fifteen, you know, p judges of the, of the court, they were, <coughs> they are so enlightened they will take a, some some right decision. No, that, that's, it seems to me something which is which is not uh, the decisions taken by the constitutional court is um, quite often or very often even not in relation to law, but but there is a, some sort of the worldview behind this position and why it le leave in the democracy in the hands of let's say 12 or 15 judges is better to go to the to give to, to the you know population right it means in the political process to take decision about abortion or let's say or 
uh, or other issues like euthanasia, for instance, right? So that's that's. Uh, uh, in short, that there are some. I don't, in my opinion, that uh, in Polish case, the, the present government is, as I said, is bending law, is treating law mm, to high degree in instrumentally, right? Is breaching the law as well, but at the same time, it, it's. I believe that there are some profound, deep changes in the legal consciousness of the population taking place, which will lead to the sort of the constitutional corrections, right? It means uh, this year there will be election, right, in, in, in autumn, so we'll see what will happen. Uh, at the same time, they are, let's say, case of Turkey, Erdogan's Turkey, or let's say Bolsonaro's Brazil, or let's say Duterte's in the in the Philippines, uh, what they are populist, of course, but uh, as you know, in the the development of the new so-called new populist movement is a sign of our time, which means that something wrong went with the liberal democracies that people. You know, switch to support the, the populist parties or the populist movement, right? And we should treat them seriously and not dismiss them easily. Oh, they are populists, you know, uh, which means it's a dirty word, right? It means nobody cares. No, it means if you look now the huge support in in Italy or let's say in France for the populist parties, mm -hmm. that's something really important and it shows that is something wrong in the institutional design and operation of, a, of a constitutional regimes in, uh, in Europe, and not only in Europe, but outside Europe as well. Right? Mm -hmm. As you uh, said, there were many political aspects for, for example, Poland's, uh, you could say, sliding down, but um, there was um, a huge controversy around abortion in Poland this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, also this year, one of the, I couldn't say main events, main catastrophes, obviously the Russian-Ukrainian war. And because of Poland's uh, help towards Ukraine, I haven't heard anything really about the topic of abortion in Poland. Would you think that was, that is like, like you could say a little plus for Poland or? No, this is still, it's still sort of the, Hot topic, actually. I, you know that <coughs> um, probably the pandemic, not so much the war in Ukraine, but the pandemic, you know, and all those <coughs> restrictions imposed during pandemics, they, that you haven't seen the so-called women's strike. It means this mass protest of women against this tough anti-abortion law. But uh, if we go back, it means if you look that this. Uh, so the, the very restricted abortion law, the first verdict, was not done by the present, you know, uh, consular court, but by the so-called liberal time. Yeah. In the past, the effect of the compromise between the Catholic Church, right, which played important role, especially in the beginning of the 90s, right, and, and not so much I, nowadays, it seems to me, because society became more and more secular, actually. But in the beginning of the 90s, that court adopted this tough type of the abortion law, anti-abortion law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But still is a hit, hot topic and uh, I believe that it will be again a hot topic during the uh, election campaign. Yeah, yeah, definitely, because from uh, what I gather from people that I know and uh, people, people abroad, they didn't really know that Poland had these restrictions on abortion. They only knew about the United States. And that was like one of the main reasons why they found out that Poland is also having these strikes for rights uh, for women to have abortions because there are many aspects why would women have abortions. So it was very interesting to see how the world shifted and actually put their focus on Poland and um, a little bit drifted away from the USA perspective. But in, as I understand anyway, that in, in this, this ruling of the 
of the Supreme Court in the U.S. was not precisely about the abortion, but about the about the division of between the states and the federation, right? Yeah, it was. And they claim that the decision about the you know regulation of abortion is in the hands of the states, yeah. not on the federal level. But in the case of Poland, which is the you know homogeneous state, not federal state, that was uh, precisely repetition of the. Um, of uh, law which or the verdict which was before so there are some situation in which the abortion should be allowed but at the same time that's just recently there was a case when the um, the medical practitioners they claimed the consciousness clause and refused to do abortion you know, to, <coughs> to do abortion to the to uh, mentally you know uh, ill young girl who was raped right and uh, and that is again this sort of the became a political issue as well it, because quite often let's say that this uh, <coughs> medical practitioners they simply claim this consciousness clause and, and they refuse to to do anything now how to cope with the problem right it means that that uh, how the, they should be institutionalized in such a way that I understand that let's say the doctor could refuse to do it because he's against his consciousness but at the same time the hospital should uh, should inform which doctor could do it right yeah, it yeah, of course. but that was that was not not the case in this uh, you know of this uh, young rape girl right yeah i think that both in both in the us and uh, and in poland a big part also in the laws plays kind of the the social aspect to them which in i think in texas where abortion has now been uh has been made uh, illegal and in Poland is the kind of the religious aspect to it and kind of the, the demographics of the of the place either if, if either it is Texas or Poland kind of the, the the constitution really doesn't enforce it but the kind of the people who live in the country but of course the constitution also uh, is the basis for it but uh, okay so you you claim about the push Social background for the regulation of abortion, yeah. right? Um, for sure, it, it seems to me that that uh, there is a. If we discuss, let's say, the Polish case, right? There is a sort of the internal contradiction, because uh, who is running the country? People in my age or a bit younger, <laughs> which means the old. Guys, even not <laughs> not women, not many of women, uh, with a conservative point of view, conservative world view. At the same time, you know, there is a young generation, the people who not only grew up according to the old customs, let's say, but they travel freely within the within Europe. They go for exchange, for instance, and they come back and they discover that mm -mm, world. That our rights are not implemented, right? In, in opposite, are restricted. So there is a generational gap between between within the country, on the one hand, and then is also the political situation, right? The political situation, uh, especially as far as the role of the of the Catholic Church is concerned, because you know traditionally Poland is a Catholic country, and uh, and that has something to do, it play. In my opinion, pretty important role in preservation of independence, right, of Poland. So during the partition time, in this what Prussians they were Lutherans mainly, then then uh, you know Russians were Orthodox Church, and only Austrians were Catholic. But Austrians mm -hmm. who occupy you know mm -hmm. the, <coughs> the small part of Poland. So is that the Church played the role of bas basically the substitute of the state. Uh, keeping the language, religion, and, and uh, sort of the um, culture, right? preserving of the culture. The same happened during the communist time. It means that uh, I remember I took part in the solidarity movement in the <coughs> in the 80s, 81, and and when it was implementation of the martial law, 
in Poland, where was this meeting place is in the church, right? It means sort of the patriotic masses, you know, anti-communist speeches and so on, took place in the, ch in the church. And the communists, the communists in power, they were not strong enough actually to really do, do something with this. So the church was uh, really autonomous, right? But with democracy, everything changed. And unfortunately, this uh, hierarchy, the institution, did not adopt it. You know, uh, this, <laughs> or not adopt it. They preserve the old attitudes, right? And uh, sort of the thought that position will be the same, but it's not the same. And remember, is uh, also growing uh, individualism, right? It means before even solidarity movement, you know, 10 million people, that there was a sort of the limited pluralist inside the, inside the solidarity. Now it's a pluralist society, right? When the religion is treated as a private matter, not a public matter, right? But never, still the church influenced the politics, right? It's playing an important role. Yeah. Maybe what then is kind of your opinion on the European Union and how maybe they have responded to uh, things happening in, uh, in, in Poland? Well, I, I was just, yesterday I attended this debate between the two presidents, it means the Latvian president and the Polish president. And uh, they didn't discuss European Union, of course. There was <laughs> sort of the security issues, you know, connected with the war in Ukraine. But, uh, but I thought about it, it means that situation of Latvia, let's say, and Poland is different, right? Different probably because of the size, right? It means uh, the danger is the same. It means big neighbor, right? Big neighbor which could swallow easily <laughs> one and another country. But the position is different. It seems to me that in the, for the Baltic states, because of, the, of their size, they simply so that they push towards the further integration. When Poland is a bit bigger, right, let's say, with 38 million people, and they want to, to be recognized, that's my interpretation, by the European Union institution as a, as a big player, right? It means sort of the comparable with Italy, Spain, right, uh, France and Germany. Right? But they are not, because of the it's economically, it's not that powerful, let's say, like Germany. And that's why this tension, so it means that um, generally is a, if the tendency within the European Union is towards the federalization, right, further movement towards this direction, then the polls are not only the government, it seems to me, but uh, rather majority of polls, that's my intuition, is against the further uh, federalization, right? They are rather want to see this community of the independent nations, which means integration, but not federalization. And, uh, <coughs> but there's a, also confusion, it seems to me, because, uh, you know, in, after 1989, after the collapse of communism and all those changes, right, that there was this slogan that uh, joined the West, right, quickly, which was very naive, right, by the imitation of the institutions and so on. Nowadays, it's much more realistic attitude. They see also that uh, European Union is not that as ideal as they thought, let's say, in 2004, when they voted in a referendum to join, let's say, the majority voted. And uh, it is visible in the attitude, let's say, to introduction of Euro. You adopted Euro, that the pots are against. They want to keep their slot, right? It, it means as a symbol of independence, right? And uh, not only symbol, because they are rational, that they control that, you know, this, this fiscal policy within the, within the state, right? Mm -hmm. So they are, you know, in Nobody is telling the we are leaving the Union. No, 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 it's not, not, not like this. Quite often, you know, you could read in the news that, oh, well, it's an accusation of the Pol Polish <coughs> government that they want to leave. No, 
and of course it's translate to the to the legal issues in this relation between the you know European law and the national legal system right as you know there was this famous judgment of the of the Council court in Poland in relation to the, of the supremacy of the Polish constitution over the let's say European law but that's we have to look at this from the let's say dialectical point of view right it means it's a sort of the tensions but the outcome of the tension is some compromise right and and of course nowadays uh, the war in Ukraine basically cover all those uh, contradictions and rather show the unity right? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I would say it was it is rather difficult or hard for states to be independent of their own if they're a part of a bigger organization and keep their independence for example as currencies evolve and change it, it, you kind of like sell your independence but you're still your own state so I would agree that sometimes these actions that uh, oh no I w uh, the state doesn't want to uh, have euro as currency are seen as bad rather than they're keeping their own stance and independence as in mm -hmm. their own country well, you know, in the case of, of the Central Eastern European countries, it seems to me, there is a different meaning of independence than in the West, actually, because of the experiences with, with uh, you know, this, this communist time. Yeah. So that independence is, is treated as a really important value, yeah. right? When uh, uh, for the, our, let's say, Western sisters and brothers, they don't put so much big attention because they, they always have this independence. Yeah. So it's sort of the, the you know, currency of the day, right? Well, here is a celebration of that. So it's a question, probably after maybe two generations, it means 50 years, there will be the same attitude. But at the moment, it's a different, right? It's enough to, to look at this uh, celebration of, let's say, the Latvian day and the flags and the people, you know, wearing the colors, right? And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not only patriotic, it's sort of the different meaning given to the, to the value of, of independence. Yeah? yeah, I think because of departing from the Soviet Union, we as a small country, I feel like we have to prove that we, are, that we can be independent, <coughs> that we can be strong even being little. And we showcase this strength by being a, a unity and showing off our country's colors and and help and uh, saying thank you to the military and everyone involved in actually making this happen. Because sometimes, on a more political aspect, we have these negative thoughts about our politicians and about our heads of state. But um, in reality, without them, what would we do? Can yeah. okay, no, um Regarding, I think the European Union, I think kind of Polish situation as well as Hungarian situation, kind of has maybe showed that there has been kind of this uh, not imaginary but kind of imaginary uh, rule of law in Europe, which kind of oh. was kind of, uh, uh, supposed. Oh, there is this. It's it's very strong. But when one of these big countries kind of showed that they Kind of don't want that their constitution and their laws are supreme over the European uh, European Union laws that they kind of didn't have anything in response. Kind of, and do you think that there is a rule of law crisis in uh, Europe, like the institution on an institutional level? I don't know. <laughs> so this, so this answer no is it. I don't like this expression, it is a rule of law crisis, actually, because it, it presupposes that before was ideal situation, right? Yeah. It was never ideal situation. If you, if you look at the judgment of the, you know, that um, uh, German Council Courts, right, for instance, in, in Salange 1 and 2, that was always sort of the tension between one and another uh, mm, uh, system, right? And that's good, it seems to me. Now, is a crisis of rule of law, I say, mm, in some countries, right? Um, what are the criteria for evaluation? I mean, uh, as I said, I don't know too much about 
Hungary, right? It means uh, about the situation in Hungary. I spent some time actually in Budapest, you know, with, uh, and I thought in a, in a f few times in the CEU courses, I've got Hungarian colleagues, but, but my colleagues who are, let's say, liberal democrats, they claim that it's a crisis, constitutional and rule of law crisis. On the other hand, I've got uh, also uh, some friend who is a legal sociologist, and uh, he claimed there's no crisis. And I don't know, you know who is right, who is, who is wrong. Probably I should go over there and, and do some <coughs> empirical, you know, research. <laughs> but uh, in, uh, in Polish case, on the other hand, right, mm, we know that very often, let's say, law is being used by the by the European institution in a very instrumental way, right? And what's more important, actually, that is uh, mm, pushing the process of further integration outside the law by the European Union institutions, which create reaction in the in the other states. That one of the prerequisites for the rule of law is equality, right? It means equality before the law and in law. Now, if you look at the operation of the European Union, it means uh, from the point, state point of view, there is not equality, actually, right? It means there is a different position of the powerful members and the less important position of the not that powerful uh, members. So, is a, and there are no, is no constitution, as you know, is a, is, a, is a constitutionalism, which is sort of the, mm, based on the treaties, right? Because you could talk about the elements of constitutionalism in the European Union. But at the same time, it means we could criticize, it means, the European Union for instrumental use of law, right? Uh, European law, and also for the breaching the concept of rule of law. Having said that, is I, one of the lectures in this 25th anniversary, which probably will take place in May, will be given by the very good scholar who is a not lawyer, but specialist in the European uh, relations from the University of Hong Kong, right? <laughs> and and, uh, and he, he just published a book about, you know, the European Union and and I spoke to him, and he is willing to give online lectures. Won't, won't be coming here, but will give online lecture, you know, about the European Union. And actually, he's Slovak, from Slovakia, so it means uh, he's from our part of the region with the <laughs> experience from here. And, and it's and it's a very critical, actually, in relation to the to the European uh, politics uh, of the inside European Union. Then from the legal, let's say, theory or the constitutionalist point of view. There was an important book actually published also maybe two years ago or one year ago by the guy called Wilkinson from uh, LSE, London School of Economics, and in which he claimed basically there in this book that uh, Europe, and it's not only a deficit of democracy, what everybody is repeating, but also that there is a problem with, uh, with rule of law inside the European Union. Because, uh, and then he's going back, you know, and trying to show that, that uh, function, what is called rule of law, is anti-democratic, actually. It means to push, uh, to, to build a barrier between the, between democratic processes and to cut off some areas from democratic uh, process of deliberation and leave in the hands of the technocrats only. And uh, he used, you know, what I remember from the discussion with, uh, with um, him that was that he uh, claimed that the model actually for, for uh, such type of, of law, right, inside the European Union came from the, the first German constitution, which as we know was imposed on German. 
Germans, not was not developed by Germans, right? Mm -hmm. but, but occupy powers, and then with uh, reference to the so-called ordo liberalismus, which was uh, political idea, a political ideology which developed in the twenties and thirties, right? In uh, in uh, not only in Germany but also in France, right? Mm. So that's coming back in short to your question is uh, there always will be a tension right, between the, this uh, law of European Union and the law of the nation state. The issue is it means how to harmoniously solve the problems and the, solve the tensions, which means there is a need for the institutional design, which means it's your job, guys, not my job because <laughs> I'm old, but you should think about it from the point of view of the, how to design the institutions, actually, to, to, s to make this process smooth, right? Mm -hmm. Well, well, doing my own research, I kind of found like maybe two things that can sound uh, uh, that I thought was quite weird, that uh, European courts, at least the ones uh, in uh, contention with uh, with uh, Poland, that they sometimes also with uh, other countries, for example, like Germany and uh, when England, uh, U UK was still part, that they sometimes kind of went above the law. They kind of they were faster than the law actually what the law actually said. And the other thing was that I. Th that obviously European Union is a political institution and uh, in the context of Poland I think that now obviously they, they were threatening that they were going to take away uh, European Union's budget if they don't kind of comply with the rulings of the uh, European courts but at this point uh, with the Ukrainian crisis and when Poland is so supportive of the European crisis and they are basically a buffer zone between Russia and the rest of Europe, probably no one is going to do that while continuing kind of the fight with Hungary, who is kind of on the other side of the... It's not precisely the budget, but it's, it's you know, this uh, mm, funds, which yeah, yeah, yeah. stimulation funds, mm -hmm. and that, that I think that Poland never received this money actually because because of this uh, criteria which ba are based on the rule of law assessment in the country. And uh, at the moment now it means there is a process in Poland when the of the parliament, the lower house of the parliament, same right, adopted a new statute which regulated uh, some issues as required by the European Commission, basically. But, uh, and, uh, but we will see. I don't believe that, that actually that this, it will repair the situation. That the Minister for European Affairs, right, that he claimed that, well, he simply you know, um, negotiate with the uh, European Union, that all those requirements and that, that so-called milestones, right, and that will open the road for the release of money. I don't think so. And <coughs> with uh, Hungary, is uh, a bit different story, right? But uh, remember, is uh, the difference between Hungary and Poland is such that, that uh, Orbán's Fidesz party, right, had a, a constitutional majority, which means was able to change the constitution. When in Poland, that was uh, mm -hmm. impossible. So the reform was sort of the changing the constitution from inside right it means by the by the change of the of uh, rules of operation of some institutions that precisely uh, is a you know that this stretching or bending some okay. some rules and law right and uh, but in both cases, it seems to me, in Hungary and in Poland, is a question of judiciary, which plays an important role. And uh, so to speak, I've got a critical opinion about the judiciary in Poland, right? Uh, that after 1989, you know, when was so-called round table talk in 88, 88 right? 
and one of the crucial issues, because nobody knows what will happen after election, everybody th thought that there will be some sort of the restricted freedom, but the communists will still hold power, right? Therefore, the crucial for the preservation of freedom was the position of judiciary. And the uh, negotiation went in such direction that was the establishment of the so-called National Judicial Council, which will appoint judges, right? And the preservation of the of the independence of the of the judges, but everything changed, and surprisingly, at the, in the in the same the same time, the judiciary adopted a corporate structure, which means became basically not accountable to anybody, right? Only for themselves. So what to do? It means in each country that there is an element of the accountability of the judiciary to other institutions, right? But um, so the government, means the ruling party, wanted to do something but, uh, and uh, introduce some reforms which from the, uh, on the very beginning, that was probably in the good direction. But later on, the Minister for Justice in Poland, who came from the minor coalition partner, a very radical one, it means this make a total mess with all those reform process of the judiciary in, in Poland, right? And uh, nowadays, it means if you look at the, only from the statistical point of view, uh, the new National Judicial Council um, accepted and the president appointed about 3,000 new judges, which are not recognized as a independent judges by the older colleagues and and is a is a mess but who is a probably suffer most citizens because of the possibility simply to to delegitimize the process of the of the administration of justice so it's a huge problem really huge problem right what is quite in, from the political point of view important that since the basically 92, 93, the, some, the gov some governments tried to reform judiciary, they never succeed. Means there was so big opposition, right? But the good news is, the good news, because always is the good news, is that because of the tension between the parliament, executive power and judiciary, then the constitutional consciousness within the citizens grew up, right? It means people started to read the constitution. Can you imagine? It means before the constitution was, was who cares, right? It means, and now they do. It means they really read the constitution. They knew which article is, is, is uh, sort of the regulating, right, the position of judiciary. So is a growing of the legal type of culture in society. There's a good, uh, but sociological outcome, right? Not a, not a legal as such. I was waiting for the good point of view. We were talking more about the problems during our podcast. I was finally waiting for some good news, <laughs> and I finally heard them. <laughs> oh yes, yeah. I mean, there are plenty of good news. It seems to me that they're not only some gloomy pictures. I don't yeah. want to present a gloomy picture. Mm -hmm. No. Well, maybe to end our first episode on a high note with the good news, uh, maybe you could share some words of wisdom for our listeners, something positive to look on to wisdom. in the future. Yeah, something good. But, but you know, your question presupposes that I'm wise, but I am not <laughs> sure about that. You know, that quite recently, I in the process of preparation of this of this course on, on uh, comparative law, I. I started to read a book written by actually by the, our colleague from India, a lawyer, very good book about the legal methods, right? Um, mm -hmm. And he wrote something there that which really struck me that he said, knowledge is between information and wisdom. What we teach students is knowledge. We pass on knowledge, but we don't teach you to be wise. Mm -hmm. To be wise is an individual process. It's impossible to teach. You know, the question about the mistakes is coming, coming back again, right? But uh, so, good, wise approach is the first of all, be independent in thinking. Be critical in thinking. Question everything. 
they are now with all authorities would say something, question that. When you question and and then you rethink, you could accept, but you accept on your own, well, in your own way, not because it was said by somebody, right, but because you are convinced that there are some very solid argument behind that, right? And, and, and enjoy studying and as <laughs> yourself. It means as much as possible, it means, uh, come on, listen, that process of studying, right, is uh, as important in the classroom as outside the classroom. It means in the process of the, of the social interaction with your colleagues, friends and so on. So enjoy and in such way you will grow up to become potentially wise in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. It was our pleasure to have you here and we were really grateful that you agreed to come and uh, thank you for listening to our podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.